Hey guys, I have a question for you. Why do people pray? No mundo. So the other day I was looking at uh, Luke chapter 11, and I love that chapter because there's a lot that Jesus has to say about prayer. And I'm going to spend some time there today, so if you want to pull out your Bibles, let's get into it. I want to read through some of uh, Luke 11, break this apart, and kind of talk about praying like Jesus. But just the other day, I was actually uh, talking to my wife. I asked her, I said, hey, why do you think people pray? What's the main reason people pray? And she started to talk to me about, you know, it's like about getting to know Jesus, about uh, coming close to the fellowship with the Father. And, you know, and all these were great answers if I was talking about Christians. But I wasn't referring to Christians. And I restated my question. I said, no, no, I would just be in general, just the Christian, the Muslim, the, the atheist who's just taken a shot in the dark. Why do do people pray? And I think I would argue that one of the main things that people, the reason people pray uh, is to get a result to the prayer, right? That's what we call them, answers to prayer, right? Usually their requests, their petitions, you know, they're intercessory for something. And and so the main thing is, is, is getting results, right? That is, I think if we really are honest with ourselves, why do we pray? And yes, and I think as we go into the Christian, and we'll probably talk about this in other videos, about why Christians pray and what the fruit of prayer, but just as that, just that baseline, why people pray in general, it's, it's to get something, to see a higher power intercede and in, get itself involved in a situation and resolve it. It's just as simple as saying, hey, I need food and food comes, you know, uh, there's the result is what we're looking for when we pray. We don't, you know, I think sometimes we can get into that tradition of prayer where it's like, why do you do this? I don't even know why I do this. And we have to be careful of that. But why do we pray? We pray to get results is I think is the goal. And I think sometimes we, we kind of get slapped on the hand uh, as Christians when we're like, well, I'm praying to get a result. And it's like, don't know, hey, you know, let, let the Lord do whatever he wills. Or I'll just be happy with whatever it is, whatever the answer is. But, you know, as I've looked through scripture, I believe God has called his people to be people that pray right and pray prayers that get results. I believe that the, the power of the, of the prayer of the Christian has great power in it. There's great work that can be done through it. I believe it is the will of God that things happen on this earth because his children prayed. Amen. So I want to go through Luke 11 right now and talk about some things about prayer. I want to, you know, who is the greatest example we can have in the Bible of learning to pray? I would say Jesus. And I think that's exactly what this disciple was thinking in verse one. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. We're about to go into verse two here. And uh, what's really interesting is this, ver this, this passage, which actually is also in Matthew six, uh, is called the Lord's prayer, right? And, uh, you know, and, and most of you, maybe, maybe watching, it's like, you're familiar with it. Recite it. Maybe you can recite the whole thing. Some of you, maybe you're not even really in church anymore, but you grew up in church. You're like, you know, uh, you know our father who art in heaven, hollow be thy name. And you can get right into the whole King James lingo of it all and everything. And it's like, I know that I've been to churches where it's, it's just, it is a rule that you, we recite that prayer every service, maybe twice, maybe three times. Right. And, uh, you know, and I remember being at Bible college, and I remember this this uh, professor was discussing this particular passage, and he actually brought this up about prayer. And he's like, these disciples have been watching the Son of God pray, and they get stirred enough to go, hey, teach us to pray. And I, and I think about that. They're from a very religious background, right? They're, they're Israelites. Gosh, they, they've been a God people, a praying people, a religious people, forever, right? So prayer is not some foreign thing to them. These 12 disciples have been around prayer their whole lives, right? When they were circumcised as babies, there was probably prayers being prayed around them, right? By the priests and, the, you know, and as they grew up in the synagogue as young boys and all these things, you know, around the Pharisees and around the temple and around Jerusalem on those holidays, the prayers are, and around the table on the Sabbaths and around the table at the Passovers, there was prayers offered and then this Jesus shows up and he prays like all the other rabbis do. But there's something about his prayer that he's like, this disciple goes, hey, teach us to pray like that. How, how should we pray? And like I said, they could go back to this whole thing of, you know, it's, it's like, well, they should know how to pray. They've probably been taught it their whole lives of how to pray as an Israelite. But there was something about how Jesus prayed that got their attention. I believe it was twofold. I believe the first thing 
was obviously Jesus got results when he prayed. He was a man of prayer. And sometimes he said in the story, so Luke, he talks about it a lot about Jesus. He would be out all night praying, but it wasn't just about the results, I believe that got their attention, but it was also how he prayed, the words he used, the conversation he would have with God. It was something they had never heard before. I'm even reminded of the, the time where Jesus was uh, speaking and the people were so amazing. He's like, who is this? He speaks as one who has authority. He's like, what are they talking about? The Pharisees have authority. The, the priests have authority, but now they see someone like he has authority when he's like, he knows what he's talking about. And so like in the same place, he, every time we look through scriptures, I actually just did a research on this about when Jesus prays throughout the, the gospels, we never see him as far as I can tell, reference God as Lord, reference God as, as, as a King or your majesty. He would always say father that was different. You know, and, and there were times when Jesus referenced God as Lord, but when he referenced it, he was referring it. Sometimes it would be, he would be referencing an Old Testament scripture and the word Lord was used. The name Lord Jehovah was used and he would reference that. But when he was praying and speaking to God, he would say, Father. For example, the, the passage where he says, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise. He prays different, right? He talks different to this God, the God of Israel. This particular rabbi prays different. And so it's got these disciples' attention, like, hey, teach us to pray. First of all, we would like to see prayers work. And then second of all, we don't pray like normal people. And I'm reminded actually of a story. I'll probably share this a couple of times in other videos. I remember when I was down in Guyana as a missionary and I was helping a church, we would go out and evangelize to the homeless on Friday nights. And I was reminded one night when we'd always share food and at the end we'd always offer to pray for people. You know, and I'm always very careful about prayer because it's like, guys, prayer is real. P prayer works. It's not just some kind of method or or tradition we do as Christians, you know? No, I believe it is part of the calling of a child of God. It is part of the mandate of the Christian life is to pray. And I just pray just to say something, to pray, to get results, to move mountains, to impact this world, to bring in the kingdom of God, as we'll see in Jesus's teaching. And, and I remember as I was in Guyana, I, I remember praying for this one man. I just, and I just I never forgot this. And I don't say this to boast of myself, but it's like, Lord, let this always be true of me and let that people see this in me just as they saw it in Jesus. I get done praying for this man. I don't even remember what I prayed for him, right? But I remember him looking at me and goes, wow, you, you pray like you know the guy. And I was like, praise God. You know, I was like, I want that to always be my, my aim. I hope it becomes more and more evident in my life. That's my prayer. And I pray that for everyone, that, that people would see more of Jesus in us, that, that people would see that we know God. When those skeptics come in your life and they're like, it's like, I don't believe you. And I'm like, man, I don't know. The way you talk to God, man, you really look like you're convinced you believe he's real. And it's like, and I do. I know he's real. I know him. I don't just know his, his existence. That was easy. It's knowing him and his character and how good he is and how powerful he is, how holy he is. And that's an ongoing relationship and growing in that revelation pray that. And I was just so shocked by that because that man said that to me. I knew every night ministers were praying for this man, that ministers came out in the streets every night. And he said to me, wow, he was like so shocked. He's like, you kind of pray like you know the guy. I do know God and you could know God too. He speaks and we can listen. We can speak with him and there is fellowship. And that is what prayer is. And it's a powerful thing. You know, it's like Paul said, we are co-laborers with Christ right? We are to, we are working this earth. You know, if it was just all about going to heaven and praise God, it's about going to spend eternity with Jesus, but it's about, there's a work to be done on this earth. And we have been given the weapons and the tools and the, 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 the ability and the authority to, to, to do that on this earth. So they say, Jesus, teach us to pray. And so what he does is we go into Luke 11, going into it. And he says this, and he said to them, when you pray, say, and I want to stop here for a second because I want to point something out here. And maybe some of you have already noticed this in your in your Bible study. But, you know, in, in some passages and some Bibles, right, um, you know, things or sections are separated by titles, not just chapters, but within the chapter, there'll be titles, you split things. And if we're not careful, we can think that a new thought, a new day or a new timeline is or something is shifted and something totally different is happening. We have to understand, actually, in this chapter that verses 1 through 13 is all about prayer. He is continuing the conversation after he says, pray this prayer. And he says the Lord's prayer. 
he is actually not done teaching on prayer. And we have to realize that. So he says, teach us to pray. He says, when you pray, say. And I want to point out the word say here, right? So there's this mixture of prayer. And there's different types of prayer. And hopefully I'll do a video on that in the future, Lord willing. But he says, say. He doesn't say, ask. Now, don't get me wrong. There are aspects of prayer that say to ask. But there's a time for asking and there's a time for saying. And we're going to get into this. I know some people struggle with that. I actually have recently heard of a man who was talking about the word of faith movement. And they were like, they, they teach that we're controlling God. And, and I'm like, no, by no means have I heard that. Now, maybe I can't j- c- talk for everyone in the word of faith movement, but from the people that I've known, I don't hear them teaching that, that we can control God by no means. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. And he is the one who is in charge. But we are to do the things on earth as he has commanded us. And if he says, say this, I'm to say that, right? So he says here, say, he doesn't say ask. Like I said, there's a place for asking, but there's also a place for declaring, amen? So he goes into that famous prayer, the Lord's prayer, right? He says, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, amen? I wanna start with something. I wanna explain something about this thing. And I, I know some denominations teach, You know, I don't know if they teach it, but I know I've experienced it where they pray that prayer word for word, right? Jesus is not saying, this is the prayer you're supposed to pray. Don't pray any other prayer. This is the prayer. That would be obviously not true because we see it throughout scriptures, throughout Acts and throughout the letters. They don't pray this prayer. You don't ever actually see it outside the gospels. You never see that prayer again, right? And so throughout Acts, they're praying prayers. That prayer is not mentioned. Does that mean it's like, well, we don't need to pray? It's not about that. Hey, if you're someone who's like, I like praying, enjoy, pray it. It's it, it, it Pray it in faith. It, it's good. But I want to talk about the reality of what Jesus is doing here is he is giving principles of what praise is. You know, it's like almost say this, this is what you can say to God. So he says this and he says, our father. And I want to talk about four foundations of our walk, our life, our our prayer life, the four foundations we need to establish in our lives, to be these prayer warriors, to be these people that see prayers have results. And guys, I believe, I believe there's, there's prayers that don't work. Sometimes it's like, you know, I remember the other day I was talking to, I had posted something on, on my, our Twitter account. And I had said something about, you know, it was talking about how Jesus said, um, when he was talking about this, it's like, your faith has saved you. And I said something, it's like, you know, it's like, just because someone doesn't get healed is not evidence that God did not want them healed. And someone had responded and it was, I think it was an honest question. They're like, it's like, so are you saying that anyone who doesn't get healed doesn't have faith? And I was like, no, of course not. But now I will back up a little bit and say, that would imply though, there are times we're not in faith when we pray. It, James, the prayer of faith avails much, right? And so we're, there's principles of prayer. And I believe there are prayers that don't work, okay? And there's times it's like, well, Joy, this, this so-and-so prayed this prayer. I know I was one of them before I was saved. I prayed a prayer to God and it was in desperation. There was no faith in it. I was just desperate. Now, maybe there was faith. I don't know, but it was like, I was just shooting in the dark. And God was merciful in that scenario. And he saved me and he brought me out of darkness. And, uh, and, and actually, I think there's principles taught in this that will show that actually that still works. But there are things, there are prayers that don't work. And there are principles in the word of God that show us how to pray. And if, what are those, what's the point of the principles? It's not about a script, guys. Now, remember this, uh, verse 2 through, uh, through 4 is not a script. I remember Craig Hagan saying this one time, said we treat the Bible like it's some spell book, right? If you say the spell exactly right, you're going to get what you want. No, it's not that. There's principles though, but this prayer that he says here is not a script. So I want to talk about these four foundations that are found within this prayer. And then like that, we need to realize when he's praying, where it's all coming from. The first foundation comes from the first thing he says, our father. This is the greatest foundation we can have in our lives is for us to know God, to know who he is. And I think it's very important again to reiterate that I noticed that Jesus never talks to him, to his father as anyone but his father. And he's inviting us into that same reality. He's saying, say father. He doesn't say, say Lord. He doesn't say, say king. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't take this out of context. I'm not saying it's like just dishonor because we're going to get to that. He's still king. He's still Lord. Amen. But Jesus always talks to him as his father. And he's saying, it's like, he, these guys are like, like, there's something different. Yeah, because no one's ever talked to God like he's his father. You don't see the prophets in the old saying, father, father, father. No, there's like the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. But here's Jesus saying, 
father. And you might be like, so well, he's Jesus. He gets to say that. No, no, no. He was the firstborn of many sons. His whole point was to bring in sons, the adoption, right? We are sons and daughters of God. And he's saying, so when you pray, say our father. I pray that we would get a revelation of God, that he is our father. And I've had a huge journey with that reality uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, our earthly fathers don't always shine in a way that exemplifies what a good father is, but they're not perfect. But God was the first father and he is eternal and he's never changed. He is perfect. And so we desire. So as you're growing in your prayer life, the first, first foundation, just in your Christian walk in general, what I encourage you to do is seek out that reality of his fatherhood over your life. That he is your father. Amen. As I look at this, I look at the idea of we, we t- how we talk to our fathers. We talk to fathers different than we talk to lords or kings or presidents, right? Again, I want to really stress that I'm not saying it's like just ignore his kingship, ignore his lordship. That doesn't matter. No, it's totally relevant. And we're going to get to that in the next line because he says, hollow be your name. May your name be kept holy. And that starts with us. Are you uh, glorifying God's name is holy? Are you living a life that shows that, that you know God's name is holy, that you revere him, that you fear him in a righteous fear, right? And I just look at that and I, and I think about it and say, well, how can I do that? Because how I talk to my father is different to how I would talk to the president of the United States, right? But what if the president of the United States is your father? That's a whole different conversation. I know in the last couple of years, actually probably been a while, I'm probably gonna find out it was way longer than I think it was, but the Queen of England had passed away and then they had the coronation of her son, Charles. And I remember watching uh, some videos of uh, their rehearsals of the coronation. And I remember Prince William being there and, and had to do some stuff with his father he was sitting there with the crown. And I just remember just the relationship they had. You know, this is the King of England, but the prince, he kind of joked with his father, but you could still see this reverence. It's like, this is my father, but he is also the king. But how much more can we do that? To have that relationship, it's, it's, there, sometimes we, we force to choose in these, these, in these doctrines, you know, it's like, it's like, you either got to choose him as king or you got to choose him as your father. You can't have both. And I disagree. It is kings all over the world that have sons and, and it's totally possible. And it's the reality. We are the son of the king of kings. We are the son of the Lord of lords. We are the daughters and the sons, right? And so this isn't something that's impossible. We got to stop making it like we can't be two things. God is so great and he's done such an amazing thing, but he is our father. And Jesus is going to go into this even deeper in verses 12 and 13. And he's going to continue talking about the father. I love how this whole prayer teaching starts and ends. He actually literally starts with the father and he actually ends the whole teaching with the father. It's just all about realizing the first, the greatest foundation we can have in our lives is understanding who our Father is, His goodness, His will, His greatness, His power, all these things, His holiness, all these things. Hollow be your name. So we learn to love Him and fear Him, and we go into prayer with that reality that I am talking to the King who is my Father, who is holy. And if He's holy, I need to get a deeper understanding of that. And we're all growing that. That's why I love when they say, I've heard people say, you know, it's like in Revelations, it talks about, you know, we'll just fraternity, we'll be going holy, holy, holy. Why? Because we're just going to be, we're never going to reach the end of his glory. We're never going to reach the end of how amazing in His he is and his majesty. But let's just continue to pray. Let's pray the prayers of Ephesians chapter one and chapter three, that the, the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that we would know him, who he really is. Because where the truth is, it will set you free. There are people in the church today who are in bondage because they have a wrong view of God. I was even challenged one time when a man said, if you have a wrong perception of who he is, that is an idol. I was like, wow, that's a that's a punch to the gut. And I was like, no, God, I, but that, it's okay. But he's so good to us. Let's keep going forward, right? Let's continue to dive into the revelation, stay in the word, come to know him. Let him reveal it to you, his, his character by the Holy Spirit through Jesus, says Jesus came to show us who the Father was and who he is and who he will be because he changes not. Amen? Just right there, when it comes to prayer, we realize he's our Father, but we realize he's holy. Oh, and he's holy. So how can we approach him? How do we even talk to him? I remember one time I'd had this, and I don't want to over-spiritualize it with some vision or dream. I remember seeing this idea in my head, and I remember at the door or the threshold, of, of the throne room and I sat late and I was on my face 
and I heard the father call me and he said, come. And every crawling step towards him was so hard because like, I am a sinner. I'm not worthy. This is far enough. And he called me closer and up the steps to the throne. I went on my face. I would not look at him because I was not worthy. And then he pulled aside his, the veil, the, the, the robe, and he put a place beside him and he said, sit here. And, and it just was the revelation that why, why can I talk to him? And this is going to change how you pray. And this is so important. We are as Christians righteous before him because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has made us righteous. What does that mean? It means he has made us right with him. The blood of Jesus has spoken over our lives. It's not a, it's not a label. This is so important. It's not a label. It's not just a little sticky note you get on you that says, he's righteous, he's good, he's clear. No, no, no. God has done something supernatural in the Christian. We are new creatures in Christ that are righteous before him. When he sees us, he sees Christ's righteousness. And we are seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. That is so important about where we are, where he is. Where is he in our lives? When you're praying, do you, do you realize that God is right there? Do you realize that the Father is with you at all times? He never leaves you nor forsakes you. you. You need to acknowledge that. And Proverbs says, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make straight your paths. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hallelujah. Because we're righteous. It doesn't say just come like I was doing on that in that idea. I was crawling on my face. So unworthy. No, 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 no. Come boldly to the throne of grace in your time of need. So if you have anyone out there telling you that he's a Christian, it's like you'd shame on you for trying to always asking God for things, always, always doing that stuff. No, no, no. He says, come boldly in your time of need. Come. Don't let anybody tell you you can't come. Don't ever try to condemn you because you're coming to God. You're coming to that throne of grace because you have need. He says, come, come boldly. Let us not shun the righteousness of God. And so the foundation, the first foundation we need in our lives is who he is, that we know the Father and the one whom he sent, Jesus Christ, because that is eternal life. And then he says this, your kingdom come. And he's still teaching on prayer, right? He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what I see there is I don't see an asking or a request. I see a declaration by the church, by the righteous man whose father is God. He says, let your kingdom come. And it says, well, it says we are ambassadors for Christ. Hallelujah. I want to talk about the keys of the kingdom. In Matthew 16, it says this, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, there was a certain group that would argue, it's like, no, that was Peter that was allowed to do that. Peter was given that authority. He was given the keys as the first pope in a way. You know, but the thing is weird though, is if you keep reading two more chapters, Jesus says it again. He says in 18, 18, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The problem is the second time he says this, he is not talking to Peter. He is talking to the disciples. He has given us the keys of the kingdom. What do keys do? They open and they shut. They lock and they unlock. They unlock locks. They unlock chains. They bind things that shouldn't be, that are loosed and they lock them up. Jesus is saying, I give you that authority. All authority on earth has been given to me, he says. So you therefore go and make disciples. Preach the kingdom of God that is near. It comes with power on earth as it is in heaven. Think about that. The kingdom of God, the will of God. We need to know the will of God, and he reveals it in his word. Jesus reveals the will of the God, Father. And when he sent them out to preach the kingdom, he said, the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's very interesting what happens in Matthew 10, 7, 8. It says this, that there is power connected to the kingdom. He says, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Wherever the kingdom was proclaimed, power was released. God has given the church the keys of the kingdom. And we are called here on the earth to do that work. There is a supernatural work that we do, and there is a natural work that we do. And the prayers of the saints are powerful. Christ's authority is on him. And therefore, because we are his body, that authority reigns in us. And we have been given permission and the right to use that authority on this earth. It's not about controlling God, people. It's not about controlling God. 
We are the body of Christ. We are his hands and feet. We are the hands laying hands. We are the mouth that is speaking out and telling demons to go. So we're praying. We're praying. First, we the first foundation is we know who God is, right? We know who he is, and we pray with that revelation. And then in verse 3, he says, give us, give us. I want to emphasize the word us. That's the second foundation, guys. The second foundation we need to realize is who we are in Christ Jesus. Christ has done a work in us. See, I've heard the phrase that we are to say, we are sinners saved by grace. I didn't say, no, we are not. We were sinners saved by grace. I will no longer proclaim that over my life, not because I have done anything to boast about. I boast in his work in my life. Christ has done it. If you want to know what you were and what you are not now, read Ephesians chapter 2. But then we also have to pray from that position of who we are. You talk different to your father. You talk different to a king, but you talk really different to your king if he's your father. Hallelujah. And so he says this in verse 1, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. What's he say? He made you alive, made, 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 who were, were, were. Okay, this is so important. I remember just rec- uh, just about a year ago, I was watching a documentary that was really going after uh, certain doctrines and stuff, and I, I understood their heart behind it. But, you know, they, they recited the scripture, and they were really emphasizing how you're a sinner saved by grace. You are you are this. And they literally had this scripture on the screen while they read it wrong. They said, and you he made alive who are dead in trespasses. That's how they read it. And I was like, you just literally read that completely wrong. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. He's talking to the Christian here, people. According to the course of this world, according to the power of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the who, not the sons of God, the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Guys, I am not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner, but I was saved by grace. Hallelujah. God is so good. Jesus is Jesus is real. This creation, this salvation is real. It is a transformation. It is a real renewal. Hallelujah. So he gives us, we need to know who we are when we're talking. We need to know where we are. We need to know who we are. We are righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him sin who knew no sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As a Christian, as a believer in Christ, as a Son of God, you are righteous in his sight because of Jesus. I am not a sinner anymore. I am a, I was a sinner who has been saved by grace through faith. In James 5, 16, it says this about the prayers of a righteous man, which who are we? Not because we've done something, but because he has done something. I am righteous. And it says this about me. My prayers are powerful. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Hallelujah. The effective, fervent prayer of a who? A righteous man. Who am I? Because of Christ, I am that righteous man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And guys, uh, James 5 and uh, 1 John chapter 5, I have some more teaching on the word prayer. I'll actually put a, a link up here for you guys if you want to check out that video when we're done. I'll put it at the end of the video as well. So if you guys want to check out that, some other good teaching on prayer. Guys, I want to see you guys effective in your prayers. I want to see prayers answered in your lives because I believe it's the will of God for you to pray effectively and fervently. Hallelujah. So he's talking about us. We're talking about that second foundation in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Give us our daily bread. Daily. Let's live in the now. We are to cast off all of our burdens because he cares for us. Yesterday is gone and Jesus told us not to worry about tomorrow. He says tomorrow has its own concerns. Now, does that mean you shouldn't be wise and prepare for the future and prepare for your... And he said, no, that's what I'm saying. But we are not to be anxious for anything. You know, and you know, and in these days we are we are living in the last days. I believe that, but there is a work to do. You know, um, and you know, I've sat down people and said, "So what do you? Well, yeah, you know, it's like these signs, these things are happening." You know, and I, like I get it, but you know, the master when he comes back, he, he's just to see us working, doing the work. So I'm, I'm gonna be praying, I'm gonna be preaching, I'm gonna be sharing the gospel. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. If you don't know that today, you can make that a reality in your life. Confess Jesus as Lord. Believe that God raised Him from the dead and you shall be saved. Repent of your sins and give your life to Christ. Make him Lord of your life. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is good. He will make you righteous. And these prayers we're talking about 
they will become a reality in your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Live in the now, guys. Pray in the now. Don't pray worry prayers. Pray faith prayers. Hallelujah. What about tomorrow? Today? What's going on today? What needs to be prayed for today? Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit today? Are you focused on, are you walking with that, that, that union, that communion with the Father right now in your life where any moment he can call upon you to intercede for a situation? I believe scripturally there, there are things that don't happen on earth because it's not because God didn't will it. It's because there was a man who was supposed to intercede it into life. And he called upon that man. He didn't do it. And there's times in my life, I know my life where I just feel this heavy burden to pray and I don't know why. So I'll pray in the spirit. And then eventually this revelation comes to what I'm praying for. And I'll start focusing on that. Maybe a person, maybe a, a town, whatever. And I'll just pray, pray what I know scripturally, pray what I know. And if I don't know, I pray in the spirit until I feel like it's time to stop praying. And I've seen victory in that. It's been awesome. But daily, are you walking with God daily, acknowledging him in all your ways? Hallelujah. Bread. Give us our daily bread, he says. He's teaching them to pray, guys. He's like, pray to your father and say, give us our daily bread. And as I was thinking about the word bread, I thought about another thing. You know, it's like he's talking about needs here. And in Philippians 4.19, what's he say? He shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. When we think needs, we're thinking just, and we're talking about prayer. And when we thought when this whole thing first started and this whole conversation was like, why do people pray? Needs. And it seems so selfish, but God's saying, come boldly in your time of need. Come, and I'm going to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory, he says. It's a promise. It's a promise. But I think about something when I hear the word bread. Because sometimes I think we think we think need, we think, you know, money to pay the bills. A lot of times it has to do with money, we think. But we have a lot of needs in our lives, guys. We need air. That's a need in our lives. We need food. That's a need. Guys, when someone's sick, they need healing. And I'm reminded of Matthew 15, whenever that woman came to him when she was begging Jesus to heal her daughter. And verse 21, he says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is re re severely demon-possessed. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was, was healed from that very hour. I want to focus on the word bread in the verse 26. I found that very interesting that Jesus refers to healing as the children's bread. And it's actually interesting because as we go through Luke 11, and we get to the part where he starts talking about fathers. When their child asks for an egg or they ask for bread, the healing is the children's bread. Guys, healing has always been painted with a positive light in the, in the, in the, in the, in the scriptures. And sickness has always been painted with a negative context. I, it is not the will of God for people to be sick. But people getting healed, just because they don't get healed, does not mean that it was not the will of God for them to get healed. There are things that take care. It's like this woman, she got her answer because of her faith. And again, I'm not saying just because someone didn't get healed, they didn't have faith. I myself have had definitely countless times where I have not received the answer to prayer that I wanted. I didn't get the answer at all. But that doesn't mean that I am convinced that God didn't want, have a resolution there, that he wasn't going to answer it. There are things in this world that happen that, have, that are principles that we have to take into mind. We're talking about them right now. But go, one thing I know is he's my father. He's good and he loves me. If you've watched my series, you know that I say that a lot. So then we get to verse 4. It says this, forgive. We say, forgive us, right? So we're talking again. We know who we are when we're praying, but we have to be right with him. Even the righteous, you can't live in sin. You can't live in offense. Offense will kill you. But he says, there's a condition here when we pray. We say, we forgive. He's teaching them from the standpoint of them praying in the sense of, oh, forgive me because I've already taken care of everything that you've told me to do, which is I've forgiven everyone else, right? That's already taken care of by the time we get to this. Forgive us, Lord, because I've forgiven those who are indebted to me. I've forgiven them. They're done. So that's why I'm coming to you. I'm reminded of when Jesus said, when, you took, when your brother has something against you, go to, go to him before you go to the altar. Get that resolved. Then go to the altar. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. I love that scripture. Guys, if you're struggling with something, if you're failing, if you need help, seek the Lord out. For, ask for forgiveness. Get right with God. Don't spend another moment not right with God. 
The devil will condemn you and condemn you, say you're not worthy. He'll make you, he's like, yeah, you can go to that throne, but make sure you're crawling and groveling. No, just get right with God. Repent, for, ask forgiveness. And I love it because he promised that he is faithful and just to forgive. I love the word just because the just is a legal term that it would, it's, it, it would be unjust for him not to forgive you because he has made it so that way. He has done the legal responsibility that was needed to save us, to forgive us. And he did it and it's established, it's decreed, it's done. It's written in the blood of Christ. So he is just to forgive us and he's faithful to do it. So don't delay. If you, you know, and maybe you're like, well, I don't know if I'm offended with anybody. And it's like, I would say, well, take a moment in your prayer time and you're just now just as the Lord, is there someone in my heart, in my heart that I'm not right with? I'm not, I'm offended with, you know, and just wait on him. I remember when I was in YWAM, Youth of the Mission, we would have prayer weekly prayer groups and uh, they had taught this principle. I believe I'll pray on a butcher. Someone from YWAM was on here. And she's like, what was her name? I think it was, it was Dawson. I want to say it was Joy Dawson, but I could be wrong. Um, I believe she's passed, but she taught these principles that a lot of YWAMers used in their prayer times in the group. And we would start with praise and then we would uh, repent and then we would seek the Lord, and then we'd gather together and talk, and then we'd pray. And, you know, and say, so, yeah, we would disagree with you. Yeah, I don't need to do that. It's too religious. It doesn't, hey, it worked. There was great principles, and they were, it was really good to apply. And we saw some great fruit from it. But one thing I remember is they would always say, is like, take some time just to check your heart. Was there something you need to repent of? Get it right before God. And, and do it, you know, and stuff. And I just encourage you, you know, it's like, as you're praying to God, so make sure you're right. Because the sin will block you. Sin will, sin, that's a principle right there. Another principle, it's not about just faith. It's about, you know, living in sin, uh, offense. These things block prayers. They, they affect your prayers, affect God moving on your behalf. Get right with him. But also don't live in condemnation. So let's say you're, you know, it's like, Lord, is there something wrong in my heart? Don't sit there for hours waiting for God to tell you something. If there's nothing, move on, go on. Now, if it's obvious, get it right, change. So we've done two foundations. I hope you guys are good. We're moving on. Hallelujah. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So I'm talking about the third foundation now. We know who God is. We know who we are when we pray. We also realize that there is an enemy. We realize that there is an evil one. And we don't just, we're not afraid of him when we pray. We, we realize he, who he is, what kind of power and influence he has and what he doesn't have. The problem, the, the greatest lies he's brought to the church is making him look big and scary when he's not. He is under our feet because we are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, 20 through 21 says this, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. He raised us up in him into heavenly places above all principalities. And in Ephesians 6, 12 through 17, it says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, there it is, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of of God. Guys, we have weapons. We, you know, we have mighty weapons against this enemy. He has no power over us unless we give it to him. So when we pray, we don't pray in this place of fear that all oh, the devil's out to get me. No, 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 no. We are above him. We actually, in that authority, let your kingdom come, let your way down. We speak those, those situations in life that the enemy is ruling around you. You have the ability to pray in those situations, to speak out, bring the keys of the kingdom, bind and loose the spirit of God, loose the spirit of God, bind the enemy in those places. You have the keys. Amen. So we know who he is and we have to understand that we, we have authority over him. We are not to be afraid of him. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We are not sons of disobedience. He no longer works in us. God has delivered us. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. But we need to know who this enemy is. He's been playing the same tactics since the beginning. First John 5, 18, it says the wicked one does not touch him. He does not touch the son of God, the child of God. Hallelujah. But we, we can only give him access when we permit him. When we walk outside God's plan, outside of God's word, outside of God's counsel. It has been happening ever since the beginning. He never touched Adam and Eve. He never touched their children until they disobeyed and gave treason and gave authority over. He never touched 
Jesus because Jesus never gave in. Yes, Jesus was crucified by men, but even in the temptation, he was never touched. The enemy only came with thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. These temptations were just words, and we give in to those thoughts and ideas. We have to stay grounded in the word. So when we're praying, we pray the will of God, and we just remember that the enemy, he's just a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What's that mean? He can't devour everyone. He can only devour those who make it available to him. We, we take every thought captive, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we take every thought captive and bind it and submit it to Christ. We, we come against all strongholds of the enemy. We are on the, so when you think about that, the stronghold is a defensive thing. I think we've always, we, sometimes we get taught, you know, it's like we're on the defensive and the devil's on the offensive and he's attacking us. No, no, no. He's got the stronghold. We're laying siege to his kingdom. We are on the advance. We have the victory. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That's the prayer life, guys. That's the mentality you have to have. And the fourth foundation is found actually in Matthew 6, 13. Luke doesn't write it, but Matthew adds it here. He says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So you know who God is in your prayers. You know who you are, and you know who the defeated foe is, and you know how to stand against him and against his fiery darts. And when you do that, and think about prayer, the fiery darts, think about that. You know, it's like he, he brings those thoughts like it's not going to work, it's not worth it, with a shield of faith that is built out of the word of God and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We use those against him. We speak it, we declare it, we thus saith the Lord, it is written, hallelujah. And then we worship, we worship God for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When you know who your father is, when you know who you are righteously in, in Christ, in his sight, and you know that the enemy is defeated under your feet, your worship is going to be so different. It's going to be so different. And then verse five, and he said to them, and I want to get back to the point where I was making earlier. It's like sometimes we, we think that God, Jesus, you know, teach us to pray. And he says this Lord's prayer and then he's done. No, no, he's still teaching on prayer and it gets even deeper about prayer here, guys. Jesus is not done teaching. He says, which of you has a friend? Jesus is about to use two human examples, point out how to pray. It's this simple. This is how you're supposed to approach prayer. Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. I think about that. Jesus is teaching on prayer. And I think about how many of you guys in your lives could right now, right after reading that account, could think, I know someone at 2 a.m. I could go to, and it would be no issue. I'd have, I'd have full confidence they would help me with my need. I could think of a few that could definitely do that for me. I could do it at 2 o'clock in the morning, there's not a moment of any part of the day that they would not come to my aid and help me and be ready. And God's making a point here about prayer. But in many translations, he says this, he won't give it to him because he's his friend. He'll give it to him because of his persistence. I'm not a Greek scholar. and I've said this many times, but this was pointed out to me one time uh, in the Greek on this word for persistence, it can go two different ways. The word is either persistence or shamelessness is the other word. What do you do when you don't, when you have this fork in the road between two different words that totally paint a different picture of what's going on. Because this is important. Jesus is teaching us how to pray. This guy got the result. He got the need. He got the bread he needed because of his either persistence or shamelessness. Well, persistence would be this just this constant knocking, constant knocking, constant knocking, constant knocking. And finally, the guy's like, okay, fine, take it. Do you picture that as God? Do you picture God being that way? Now you said, well, Joy, you can't go off of what you think or experience. You're right. Absolutely. Matthew 6, 7 through 8, it says this. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Guys, the word isn't persistence. So if you're ever asked, like, how do we decipher in the Greek what's really being said? One cool way you can do it is to interpret the word through the light of the whole of Scripture. Here's Jesus saying in Matthew, he's saying, don't just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over, thinking God's going to hear you because you do that. That's what persistence looks like. Guys, the word is shamelessness. The reason this guy got what he needed was because of his shamelessness. There are some people, you know, you'd be embarrassed to, you'd be apologizing whenever you woke him up at two in the morning and say, I'm so sorry, I didn't know where else to go. So I came to you and you feel so embarrassed. But there are people you will go to at 2 a.m. and you don't feel embarrassed. 
because you know your relationship with them, that they're, they've got you, they love you, and they're there for you, and they will wake up at 2 a.m. and help you. I remember about a year ago, there was a situation, I was in dire need of something, and I, I, needed, someone, I needed someone at the drop of a hat, and they were there for me, and I knew exactly who to go to, and I didn't have shame about it. I didn't have shame about asking them, and they were right there for me. And that is what he's talking about here, guys. And I'm going to re, re, reinforce that here in Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Guys, there was a time, and I think about it, every time we sing worship, we sing, we say the name of God. There was a time when once a year, one man would enter the holy of holies on, on the behalf of a nation. Once a year. And he had to be without sin himself. But Jesus has entered the holy of holies once and for all and brought us in by the blood. We have full access to the throne of God, the mercy seat of God in our prayers, in our time of need. We come boldly, shamelessly. Your prayers should be shameless. This is so important. Boldness is not begging, whimpering, and just begging, begging God to do something. No, it's faith. God is pleased by faith. What is a prayer of faith? It's convinced it's going to happen because we know the will of God. We know who our Father is. We know who we are. I'm reminded of the parable of the Son. And people talk, and I've shared about this in another video, I'll put a link for it. It's not about the prodigal son that really gets my attention, it's the other son, when God, the, the father has to correct the son, and he says, he was like, all I have is yours. You are always with me. It's yours. We're children of God. So it's not about our persistence. Because in verse 9 he says, ask, seek, knock. So I say to you, and he's still teaching on prayer, guys. Even if you got a title in your Bible saying like it's a new subject. No, he's still teaching on prayer. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus is giving you a guarantee in your prayers. Even to you right now who aren't saved, who aren't a believer yet, who aren't born again, ask God to reveal himself to you. Seek God's revelation. Knock on that door. And I really believe, I believe every atheist that would say, you know, say, I've done that and I didn't see him. I guarantee he was there because God is not a liar. But sometimes we, we don't like how God shows up because we had a picture painted of what he should look like. Jesus shows up. They've been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. They didn't like him. They crucified him. He didn't come in the way they thought he was going to come in or the way they wanted him to come in. It's like, why, you know, why didn't you restore Israel? He promises that if you knock, and you seek and you ask, you'll have it. And I don't like this translation. I love the uh, chapter, but there's a translation that says, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking and knock and keep knocking. Now, I want to be careful what I'm saying because I'm not trying to say, that's stop seeking God. No, no, no. But when you're praying, ask. Don't keep asking. Don't, because of your persistence, you're not going to get the bread. But because of your shamelessness, you're going to get the bread. Because you approach the throne of grace and boldness and you ask. You didn't have to keep nagging God for it. You asked and you believe because he promised if you ask, you get. If you knock, it's going to be open to you. The problem is with the idea of asking and keep asking and keep asking and you'll receive and knock and keep knocking, keep knocking, and it'll be opened. It gives a really difficult time for faith in the promise that Jesus just gave us because we don't know how many times we have to knock before the door is open. We don't know how many times we have to seek the answer. We don't know how many times we have to ask. When he just says, ask and you get knock and it will be open seek and you will find with all your heart it's the prayer of faith that avails much and i love that scripture when he says when he promised to me when i read that for jesus and he said ask and it will be given i see a twofold reality there i see the first one is the ask because god is not insecure god is not afraid of your questions you will never ask a question that's too hard for god he's not afraid of your questions you know, and I know sometimes people have been so angry at God and they've boasted, you know, that doesn't move God. You know, someday we'll all be held accountable for our lives. But in that moment, it doesn't move God. It doesn't make him emotional. It doesn't make him, you know, lose, lose it. Ask, seek the Lord. He says, you'll find. And then the second part is we ask and we believe. And I know that when I'm asking for something in 1 John 5, 14 through 15, it says this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. How do we know the will of God? It's in his word. Verse 10 says, everyone, this is a promise to whomever. That's why I've seen 
the unbelievers' prayers answered because they asked. They didn't know what they were doing. They asked. The principles of God work, guys. The promises of God work. And this is where I'll end with, is I just love this part. If a son asks for bread from any of a father among you, remember he said bread earlier when he told us to pray, who will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him in another uh, scripture and passage of the gospel? It says, well, the, it's like, how much more will the heavenly father give good things to those who ask him? God is good and he gives good things. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the father and comes down from the father of lights from whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And I, I'll end with this. When you're praying and you acknowledge God as your good father and you know you have right standing with him because you've gotten your heart right. You're a, new, you're a born again Christian and you're living right and you've let go of offenses and you realize that the enemy is under your feet and you've taken authority over situations and you worship God and you're praying in those situations. I'm reminded of the conversation someone had about healing one time and they had stated something about how there's four different ways God heals. And I was listening and I, the first one was just divine miraculous healing, you know, and then the second one was, I believe, uh, like nature and doctors along those lines. And I was like, you get that. I don't have a problem with doctors. I thank God for doctors and the medicine, you know, and, and then the third one, he said the, the it's one way he heals is by keeping us sick, but giving us grace through the sickness. And they just lost me there. And the only thing I thought about was healing is healing guys. Healing is healing. God is not twisted. God is not weird. He's like, he is so much better. He's saying it right here, guys, guys, if your child asks for bread, will you give him a stone? And says, God's like, how much more is God? I, I need healed. And he's like, okay, well, I'm going to give you healing, but it's going to be not the way you expect it. Healing is healing. If I have pain in my body, I'm asking God to heal and take that pain away. God's like, okay, well, I'm gonna keep you, you're gonna keep the pain, but I'm gonna heal you in a different way. He's not that way. He's like, gosh, your own fathers, you would, your own fathers would be like, well, that's not right. That's not right. He's saying, how much more will your father? God, God is not Rumpelstiltskin. I don't know if you're familiar with that character, but Rob, Rumpelstiltskin was this guy who would sign these contracts for people, make these deals with people. But the way it was worded is that, uh, He'd still have done exactly what was written, but it's not what they were really intended. He knows that, but he, that's, he was such a, such a snake about it. I remember this one commercial, this guy asked a genie, and God is not a genie. But he asked this genie, he says, uh, I, want, I want a million bucks. And then the genie bobs his head, and then you look out the window, and there's a million deer out in the yard. God is not like that. Healing is healing. Bread is bread. An egg is egg. Fish is a fish. He's not twisted, guys. He is good and he is faithful. And I encourage you, get in the word of God. Understand his will as the promise is in 1 John, that if you ask anything according to his, his will, you know he hears you. And you know if he hears you, you have it. We thank you, God. There are going to leave some links here about prayer. We're going to continue to talk about prayer as we go on. But I hope this has blessed you guys. But let's pray like Jesus. We are called to be mighty in our prayers. We're, we're called to change the nations through our prayers. God, your faith today, something you can do today, your prayer can change the world today. And that's the will of God. It's not about controlling God. It's about the will of God being done through your faith and through what you've, what he's called you to do, what you've, he's called you to speak and to declare. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.